Thank you very much for having me here today to present my work, um, and it's an honor to be here. And so I thank the organizing committee as well as um, Professor Pollock uh, for organizing such a wonderful event and having us all here. Um, so I will be discussing a part of my PhD thesis where we actually looked at the role of water in anti-fouling properties of ultra-thin organic ad layers. And we have experimental and computational evidence to support our, our hypothesis with, with respect to surface hydration and anti-fouling. So, let us begin. So what is fouling? So a very general and, and very general definition and very uh, simplistic schematic representation is shown here. But basically what it is, it's the undesirable absorption or accumulation of species. And they could be bacteria, cells, um, organisms, onto any artificial surface from the surrounding environment. And we see fouling in our everyday life. It's pretty much present everywhere. And it causes major problems in various industries. For example, you have problems in the food processing. And this picture here is a representation of a ship hull that's completely covered by barnacles. So you can see how that causes a problem. But the field that I'm more, <laughs> the field that I'm actually more um, interested in at the, and for my PhD topic pretty much focused on was the field of biotechnology. And where we actually looked at the effect of biomedic, uh, fouling on biomedical equipment and biosensor applications. In the realm of biosensors, though, fouling is synonymous with the word nonspecific adsorption. Okay. So as I mentioned, I'm interested in biotechnology. So with respect to biomaterial applications, fouling causes, a severe com uh, fouling causes severe problems because when you expose an implant, for instance, to, say, blood, what happens is that the implant becomes first covered by this protein layer, and then at the end, you have this fibrous capsule. And this fibrous capsule actually affects the longevity, functionality of the device, and actually causes problems for the host. So as you can see, it's not something that's desirable and causes major concern. Moreover, with respect to the biosensing applications, I look at the nonspecific adsorption. So here, basically, what you have is you have the biological sample, where you have your target analyte, and that's present at very low concentrations. It can be nano, nanograms per liter. And then you have matrix interference, and these are all the other species that are present inside blood, and they are up to 60 to 80 grams per liter. So it's very difficult to actually sense these kind of uh, target analytes. When you expose your biological sample to your biosensing platform, what happens is that everything starts to interact with the actual platform. And this causes problems, as you can see, because you're going to get indistinguishable signal, and as a result, leading to false positives and false negatives. So as you can see, overall, in biotechnology, fouling is a major concern. So one way, actually, to, to go about to combat fouling is through the use of surface passivation and surface chemistry. So basically, the scheme really simply, uh, simply depicts what I'm getting at, where you have your substrate, which initially, when you put it in a biological species or some kind of a, a matrix, it's going to naturally absorb these proteins or species. But now, if we, in fact, place surface modifiers to make this anti-fouling ad layer, what happens is that these biological species will now be repelled. So as a result, since surface modifiers are such an important part of the ad layer, let's take a closer look at what it actually is. So you start off with your substrate, and your substrate can be quartz or gold. Well, whatever you choose, it's based on the properties that you want to exploit, so for the particular application. And then you build your, your modifier based on that. And it's consistent of three parts. You have the anchoring function, the part that's actually going to bind to your substrate. And they could be very much like trichloroxyl for oxi uh, hydroxylated, hydroxylated surfaces. It could be thiols for gold, et cetera. You have your backbone, which is, could be very simple alkyl chain. It could be oligoethylene glycol, where you incorporate the oxygen within the chain. And then you have your head function. And the head function can be any chemically compatible group. And if you want to use this for biosensor technology, you need to ensure that the head function can be um, easily immobilizable, so that you can actually put your probe onto the, onto the surface. So some examples of surface modifiers that we've actually um, synthesized within our labs are shown here. And as you can see, they all have that trichloroxyl anchoring function. The reason being is for my projects, I used hydroxylated surfaces. In particular, in the majority of the time, I use quartz. These ones here are just showing that the head function can be functionalizable because I use these ones for biosensor applications. But that's not the purpose of this conference. These are the ones actually that we use to look at um, you know, anti-fouling and for biomaterial purposes. So what we actually did was to do the um, 
the measurements, we used uh, MPAS technology. So MPAS is just the electromagnetic piezoelectric acoustic sensor. It was developed in-house, and it's an analytical flow-through device that's able to detect, detect on-surface biomolecular interactions in a real-time and label-free manner. Now, how it works is it remotely triggers acoustic resonance within the thin electrodeless uh, quartz disc by the external electromagnetic field generated by the quartz or by the coil, pardon me. So you have your copper coil, it exerts an electromagnetic field that induces a secondary electric field within the quartz, causing it to vibrate. And these are just some representation of the surfaces that we use. So as you can see, they, are, they can vary in size and they're very thin, 83 microns, and this is like a copper coil to go along. So, biomolecular, so basically what do we measure? We measure resonant frequency uh, shifts. So any biomolecular adsorption or interactions that's taking place will cause a change in the resonant frequency. So this here is a very simple depiction of what goes on. So you have your resonant frequency on the y-axis, you have time on the x-axis, and pretty much what happens is you allow your signal to stabilize, and once it's stabilized, you inject your sample. From there, you're going to have some kind of a frequency shift. You take the difference between the two points and you're going to get your overall change in frequency. And how we can actually relate that is we can relate it to biosensor technology because we're looking at biorecognition and nonspecific adsorption, but moreover, we can also relate it to biomaterial coatings and anti-fouling behavior. So very simply, the motivation of my work was to couple the surface chemistry with the MPAS technology to develop these organic coatings that are able to actually minimize fouling that occurs um, when exposed to biological fluids. So we first started by designing these new trichlorosilane surface modifiers. We prepared them um, and characterized them on quartz, and then we evaluated their anti-fouling or biorecognition, depending on what kind of application I used, um, with the MPAS. So in fact, this, this whole project was kind of twofold because we looked at the bioanalytical world with biosensor technology, and we also looked at the biomedical world with biomaterials. So now, the conference here, I presented my work on uh, unimolecular antifouling adlayer. So what that basically is, is it's basically one type of, of surface modifier used um, on my surfaces to ensure that we can see what happens when we expose it to, say, serum samples. So what kind of behavior they have in terms of antifouling. So before I get into actually what we got with the surface modifiers, let's look at quartz and how it behaves um, when exposed to serum. So what happened here is, once again, it's what I showed earlier with that simplistic diagram. But here you see that, in fact, quartz, once we inject full serum, we see that there's a huge shift, about 34,000 hertz. And so overall, we could um, conclude that actually quartz likes to be fouled. So now what we did was we synthesized some structure, uh, we synthesized some modifiers in our lab and we did a systematic structural modification study. So as you can see on this side, we have the MEG family. And what MEG stands for is monoethylene glycol. And basically that's because we have that internal ether oxygen atom within these chains. And over here we have the alkyl family. As you can see, they're just straight carbon chains. And so we looked at the different head functions and then we also looked at you know, having the same head functions as shown with OTSOH. So we have those distilled hydroxyl groups, but now we removed the the oxygen, and then we looked at straight carbon chain, we expose these surfaces to serum, and then we see what kind of effect it has overall. So what did we get? Yeah, so we got some very interesting results. So as I mentioned, bare quartz, we had about 34,000 hertz. But as you can see, whether alkylated or the MEG family, we were able to decrease the frequency shift. Um, but in fact, the MEG family was by far the best, and MEG OH being superior to them all, being about 3,000 or so less. So this is our star molecule. So we wanted to go and see what kind of actual, like first of all, we wanted to see what, if we have this surface on our, on our quartz disk, right? That's the next thing to do. So what we did was we did some surface characterization. So um, basically we used X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy and very, very, very briefly, we have clean quartz here and you can see the elemental um, peaks. So we have silicon and oxygen. So these are the, the compounds or the elements that actually make up quartz. Then we have the MEG TFA, which is shown here, and then you see we have the introduction of the fluorine peak and carbon peak, and those are elements that are very representative of our surface modifier. And then following that, to get the MEG OH, we have to cleave the um, trifluoroacetyl head function um, through a treatment of water methanol, and then we see that, in fact, our XPS is in line with that because we see that the fluorine peak is removed, 
and we also see that the carbon peak is attached. And what does that mean? Well, it means that we haven't etched our surfaces. We haven't etched the ad layer off our, off our surfaces. And these are just some contact angle measurements to just complement it. So as you can see, 16 degrees is quite hydrophilic because it's quartz. We add the MEG-TFA, quite hydrophobic because of the TFA head function. And then once we cleave the head function, we have a gain in hydrophilicity, as seen with the decrease in the contact angle measurements. OK, so um, with respect to the actual MPAS profiles, it's quite, quite um, a lot of information you can get from it. It's not just the magnitude that's important, it's also the shape that's important. So I'm just going to go through these very briefly. With respect to bare quartz, you see that what happens is you have this sharp initial drop after we first inject um, our serum sample. We have a gradual decrease and then no rinse off, which is quite um, indicative of irreversible adsorption. But now, when we have our MEGOH coating, we see something that is in quite different. So basically, you have a comparatively limited initial drop after a serum injection, a gradual and an extensive rinse off, and, that, and that's actually indicative of reversible adsorption. So now, what was very interesting is that we were able to show that, hey, we were able to decrease nonspecific adsorption or the anti-fouling of, of the serum species. but. Reading the literature, we come across the role of water. And many papers say that water is very important for um, anti-fouling. So what we did was we said, why not try our surfaces with some water? And so we did. And we saw that basically when you have, um, we did MEG-OME, so it's this structure right here. So you have the internal ether oxygen, and then you have the O-methoxy group. We tested it, um, we did a dry as well as a treated, and the treated consisted of an overnight treatment of water methanol, and we see that in fact, that overnight hydration treatment um, reduced the, the amount of frequency shift that was uh, from 13,000 to about 7,000. So in fact, our results were quite in line with what literature says, that water does play a role in surface hydration. Now, the next question is, how can we actually see this water, or how can we um, actually know what is going on? So we know water plays a role, but now what is it, what's so special about the water? Or how does it structure? And so, oh, before that, um, we know that water is quite crucial, so we see it's linked to anti-fouling, and so how do, we know it, how do we know what the water is actually looking like? And to do that, we did some neutron reflectometry experiments. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail about this, because Professor Thompson actually spoke about it during his talk, but just to, to do a little bit very, very, very briefly, um, what happens is we did a stratified model. And so what we did was we studied surface hydration by first doing um, contrast variation. So you have our silicon, silicon dioxide substrate. We have bulk water. And then basically what we did was we matched the bulk water SLD, or the uh, scattering length density, to that of the substrate. And then we also, what we did was we have this layer one. And that layer one consists of our ad layer as well as the transitional water. And the reason why we did contrast variation is to enhance the scattering contrast of the layer one so that we can see it and we can see what's so important about it and distinguish it. So doing this, uh, and if you would like more information, here is the paper that's associated with it. So um, very briefly, what we had is we had our sample, and then when we exposed it to a beam of, uh, of neutrons, we get reflectivity data. From there, we do some modeling and data fitting to get our uh, scattering length density, or SLD profiles, which gives us the information that we want to know about what the water actually structures or how it structures. So I'm not going to get too much into this because Professor Thompson did, but what is very important is the last part, which is respected of which, which actually looks uh, at the, the hydration patterns. So from the SLD profiles, basically what we, what we see is we see two distinct hydration profiles. So we compared MEGOH, so it's the, the molecule with the internal ether oxygen and the hydroxyl group, and we compared it to OTSOH. So OTSOH was the molecule that lacked the internal ether oxygen atom, but still had that hydroxyl group. And what we found was there are two distinct and different hydration patterns. And in fact, what happens is that with the MEG-OH um, ad layer, we see a longer zone, about 40 angstroms or so, and we see a much shorter one compared to OTSOH, about 20 angstroms or so. Moreover, our SLD profiles um, show that the water, or basically we interpret them to show that the water actually penetrated inside of our ad layer. So we have this kind of building up of the water ad layer, in fact, of the water transitional zone. And in fact, what happens is that there's a gradient. And as you get closer and closer to the bulk water, we see um, the water being more like bulk water. So that being said, 
What, ne what we did next was we wanted to complement these studies with molecular dynamic simulation. And this is um, what majority of my poster was about. So basically what we did was we used computational approach to investigate the molecular level structuration of water within and atop the, the antifouling ad layers. And we compared the MEG family, so those, those um, surface modifiers were the internal ether oxygen to the ones that did not have any, uh, so the straight alkyl family. And these, these, uh, these uh, molecular simula uh, simulations were done at the Tyndall Institute in Ireland. So very briefly, what we did was we actually um, had our alpha quartz and we surface functionalized it. We then, act um, we then um, have this five by five surface coverage. We put our model into a simulation cell um, of, or a box of water and it contained about 23,000 atoms. And from there, what we did was we did the radial distribution function, or the RDF, and what it is, it's, it basically describes the probability of finding water molecules organized at a certain distance from a reference. And they're seen as distinct peaks with proportional magnitude. So here is just the MEGOH, but we actually looked at um, the alkylated and the MEG family, as I mentioned, but this is just to show you what I mean by innermost and top of the film. So for the innermost film, what we did was we looked from the uh, internal ether oxygen atom down. So for the alkylated chain, it would be the same position and, and below that. And basically what you see is you see for the MEG family, so once again, the ones with the internal ether oxygen atom, they actually have distinct peaks um, shown, whereas with the OTS or the alkylated system, they do not show this peak. So as you can see, it's in line with our NR um, results where we actually have water penetrating our ad layer. And we actually, yes, we actually have that. Now with respect to the top of the film, what you see is that you see for the MEGOH, which is shown here, and the OTSOH, which was the alkylated but still has the hydroxylated group, you have distinct peaks. And this makes sense because water would actually, um, you know, come and start hydrogen bonding with the distilled hydroxyl groups. So, over, and it is in line with what we saw with the previous uh, NR data where we actually had for the OTSOH that 20 angstrom starting from the distal hydroxyl group up. So now that we know how water structures, the next thing we did was we wanted to see, so what's so amazing about MEGOH? Well, we have to look at the water dynamics or the water dynamicity. And the water dynamicity, uh, it re basically refers to the lability and the mobility of the water molecules within and atop of our ad layers. So lability refers to water's actually entering our ad layer and then leaving, so that's what that means. And mobility means that once it's actually in a position, how does it move? So we looked at these uh, you know, simulations and what we see is that, in fact, there are multiple uh, molecules of water absorbing simultaneously around the internal ether oxygen atoms as seen by a, C, and D. And there are a full assortment of different uh, hydrogen bonding interactions of water with the internal ether and the distilled hydroxyl groups. So further MD are, are looking at these trajectories, what they revealed was that in fact we have this water clustering effect inside of the ad layers and that the water residency time can be within the nanosecond regime. And in fact, we even uh, saw stuff that are around 27 nanoseconds, which is like an eternity at the molecular level. Now, what else we observed is that as you move closer to the top of the ad layer and then away, so you start at the, the bulk and then you move away, you see that the interfacial water is more labile and mobile, and that once it actually gets to, to bulk wi water, the, the water, um, it freely diffuses. So basically what we came up with to actually to, to, to link antifouling and surface hydration together were some basic requirements using you know, the information we got from the molecular dynamic simulations, the acoustic wave physics experiments, and the NR, and that gave us a nice little puzzle here that basically shows that you, you need these four requirements to actually have a surface that will be antifouling when you have the aspect of surface hydration involved. So we look at, uh, you need uh, the ad layer internal and interfacial hydrophilicity, uh, you need some sort of molecular level water structuration, and you need this hydration um, layer to be tightly bound. Moreover, you need limited dynamicity for the hydration water. So you want the water, when it's in the ad layer, to actually stay there for a long period of time. If you are lacking one of these things, your ad layer, as shown through the acoustic wave physics experiments, it won't be as anti-fouling as those with the MEGOH. So having all four characteristics is what is necessary to actually link anti-fouling and surface hydration together. So very, very briefly, some summary and conclusions is that water through surface hydration and its state, so how it actually um, structures, plays a key role in surface antifouling and protein repellency. 
you have molecular level mechanism that's rationalized in terms of a set of basic requirements, as I showed through that puzzle, where you have the internal and interfacial hydrophilicity, water structuration, hydration strength, and water dynamicity, so the liability and the mobility. And lastly, the anti-fouly mechanism that's postulated for such uh, thin structures, they're actually, uh, they concur with what's out there in the literature and accounts for the uniqueness of the mega uh, nanogel surface chemistry. Although many people in the literature, you know, sprinkle ideas here and there with respect to surface hydration and anti-fouling, um, and therefore people may feel that this is quite controversial. In fact, our findings are in line with what's in literature, and we just wrap it up in a nice little present for everyone to see. We put everything out there in one piece and we show it through our experiments. So, to end, I'd just like to give some acknowledgments and thanks to my uh, wonderful supervisor, Professor Michael Thompson, my amazing collaborators, so Dr. Krzysztof Blazikowski for the synthesis of the molecules as well as for insightful discussions, Dr. Damian Thompson for his help with the MD, uh, Ms. Natalia Pawlowska for her help with the NR, um, also the current and former members of the Bioanalytical Research Group, funding from OGS Ireland for doing the uh, Ireland Dobin Scholarship for the uh, Tyndall and MD experiments, uh, the Department of Chemistry, University of Toronto, and the organizing committee of the ninth annual conference of the Physics, Chemistry, and Biology of Water. And I would like to thank you for your attention and for being here today.